there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to paint a jar with a couple tulips in it and some water and rocks in it. I thought it was a really simple, kind of almost um, very peaceful, minimalist um, subject and I will link the reference photo below. I'm going to sketch on with color ice pencils. We're going to use Turner watercolors, which I've actually put mine in a, in a new tin so I could have them all together. And um, the supplies I'm using are from our sponsor, jerrysartorama.com. I'll be using the Mimic Faux Squirrel brushes, which are my favorites, and I've been using them almost daily for years, and they still haven't worn down. They've just held up really well for me. You can find all these supplies in the video description linked up below, as well as a coupon code so you can save some money if you decide to order. Um, the Turner paints have been on special, the 18 color intro set, so... Um, I would check them out if you're interested in this line of paints because it is the cheapest way to try them. You get 18 colors for under 30 bucks, and then you can um, you can you know order larger tubes of what you like after you've tried them out. I will warn you that the starter set does not have a good cool red, so I would add a rose red or a lizard and crimson or something to that. Um, I'm working on hot press fluid watercolor paper, and I'm going to start by drawing the jar. And the jar is going to um, take up about two thirds of the height of the paper. I'm just going to start actually by drawing a very, very, very light rectangle and I'm making this off like center a little bit. Um, I'm going to keep it really light to start off with. I am on hot press paper. These are call erase and they do erase pretty well, but um, I still want to go kind of light here. So I'm going to flip it upside down. I like to do that when I have a jar or a um, anything symmetrical like that or a vase because it just helps me uh, keep my edges straight. So I look at the sides of my paper for guidance on that and it helps me um, keep the edges fairly symmetrical. I'm not bothered by having some lines that show but you can lighten your lines up with an eraser. Just uh, don't be too aggressive with it because you don't want to mar your paper. So I'm actually going to round this over like that and just give it a little bit of a, just kind of cut in a little bit and give it that little rim. Now this is like eye level, so there's no ellipses to deal with. You can see a little bit of the, the or I should say the upper rim is, is eye level, so there's no ellipse there. You will see a little bit of an ellipse uh, at the water line. I can see that this isn't quite right, so I'm just deciding what side do I like better. Make them a little more similar, taper them in a little bit. Okay, so the water line is about a third down on the paper here, so I'm just going to put a line, it's kind of similar to the curved line I have down there. This will need to be a little bit more curved because this is a little bit more below my eye level. And there are some stones in here, which I thought just really make a nice, um, like river rocks. You know, you can buy them at the craft store, but these are like those smooth pebbles. I just think it makes a really cool design element. So why not? Um, I, I just think it looks it looks nice, and I like to see different shapes. I think any anytime you have something like that in there, it does it does add. Um, I'm gonna want a little bit more jar underneath that, so I'm actually gonna. Add a little, just a little thickness of glass underneath. And I just, I, I like that I don't have to worry so much when sketching with these pencils because they, uh, they are erasable. And these are made by Prismacolor and they're quite affordable and I will link to those as well. Okay. I'm going to grab an orange pencil for, to draw my tulips. Now, one tulip is actually in the jar, so it's kind of neat because it gets distorted a little bit by the, um, by the shape of the jar and by the glass. And it looks like this one's kind of like about ready to go by. But again, I love the shape of it. I love that you can kind of see this turned petal. I think it's just really interesting looking and I just I like how things distort as you get up to the ridge of the glass and then I'm going to put the head of this tulip up out of the out of the water here is the bottom of it I'm going to come I just kind of come up a little bit straighter this one's a little bit more fresh 
Now the water is not going to dissolve these pencils, so that's another thing that I like about the call erase is that I can erase the lines if I don't want like them before I start painting, but um, it's not like a watercolor pencil where the lines are going to dissolve. If you don't want to see any lines at all, I suggest you use a watercolor pencil just because they will completely dissolve. I wouldn't use a water soluble graphite for this just because the graphite itself will give it a little bit of a... Um, Oh, you know, like, uh, it'll give it kind of a, a grayed out, kind of grimy dirtiness to it, so that's why I wouldn't use that. So I'm going to bring that, now I'm using a green really lightly because the, the stems are actually a little bit more yellowy, but I wanted you to be able to see it. When we get to the water, I'm going to make it fatter so we can see the distortion. And same here. And then this is going to get, this one can actually kind of move over and get thicker. Now I am going to erase that little spot in there. I'm a little nervous to use the eraser on the color erase, so I'm going to use a white plastic eraser because I know it's gentler on my paper. Look how easy that erases. Is. Isn't that cool? Just love it. And if you want to lighten up uh, or change any lines here at all, you can. Just go real gentle. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to lighten up a lot of these lines just kind of so I can let the paint kind of do a lot of the defining for me. Okay, I'm going to just brush that off with a dry brush. Brush off my crumbs. And I do want, um, I do want to have like a leaf in here. Just kind of poking out. Maybe a little bit more than what the reference photo has, because I just think that's kind of cool to have a leaf in there. Looks, maybe we'll have another one just kind of reaching out that way too. All right, look at that. We are seven minutes in. We've done a lot of sketching, but now we're ready to paint. Okay, so um, if you want, you can splash some water on your paper and start painting. Um, I'm not sure if I really want to do that, but I think I will wet the whole paper and I'm going to do that with a large flat brush here. I think that I want to have, I don't like to have like my still life on just completely white a background, but you can if you want to. This paper here, this is what they call an easy block. It's bound on two sides and not on the top. So um, you just want to kind of be aware of that. I've had my paint kind of go into the next page before if I'm not careful. So you just want to kind of be careful of that. I'm going to grab some yellow ochre and put it out of my palette. So what I did when I made my palette here, since I used my own, I used two paints and I used the full pans and half pans, is the colors that I use a lot, I made sure to put them in full pans. So my yellow ochre, my burnt sienna, my ultramarine blue, those went in full pans because I know I like to go in there with a big flat brush. I couldn't get a big flat brush in a half pan very well. I'd have to go in and use a um, use a round brush. And I, I mean, although I do that, um, you know, if you're going in for a lot of paint, that could, you know, wear down your brushes a little bit easier. I'm going to mix my... Uh, burnt sienna and ultramarine together and get myself a nice gray. And I like doing that because you can make it cooler or you can make it warmer depending on how you want it. I'm going to just kind of go in here and add a little bit of tone on the tabletop area. And I find with a hot press paper, which is kind of counterintuitive, you think it would be the other way, I find that my like, and maybe it's just this fluid paper, because I've only painted with a few different brands of hot press paper, but in all the ones that I've used, it seems like the paint stays put a little bit better. You can let me know if you've had that same experience, but look at that. I mean, it's not like really rushing in to the jar, and I can go in and I can throw, you know, color around. I just don't feel like it wants to run around on me quite so much. And it could just be... Um, the level of sizing on this, but I've even found that in Arches and on the Paul Rubens hot press that I've used. Grab some of that yellow ochre. I like to give like a sunny vibe. I like to do that a little bit in the base too. And these colors are nice and light, so if I do get some on the flowers, I don't feel like it's going to be a big deal.
I'm just kind of giving it some texture. This is going to be, this is going to dry a little bit lighter because this is really dark. I've got a lot of, um, I, I mean, it's really wet, so it's going to dry quite a bit lighter. If you wanted to put some salt on at this point, you could. If you wanted to flick on some water, you could. That would give it a little bit of a, a little bit of a texture. And if you want to flick on any of your um, like colors you're going to use in the in the um, the flower itself, you can. So I'm going to use a I think like use like a let's see what that Indian yellow looks like. Oh, that's nice. And now let's take a little bit of um, a little pyrrole scarlet. I think that's what this one is. We'll flick some of that in there. Okay, now I'm going to look for puddles because puddles are where cauliflowers happen, and I might not want cauliflowers. Actually, it doesn't seem to be puddling. I think because this is the one, the fluid 100, which is 100% cotton. It doesn't tend to uh, it doesn't tend to puddle quite so much. It absorbs a little bit more. That's another thing with the, I've noticed this with all hot press papers I've used as well. I feel like they, the color grabs quicker and it stains a little bit. So you might want to kind of keep that in mind um, that it's going to be difficult, more difficult to lift on hot press. At least that's been my experience. I typically paint with cold press. So what I'm going to do now is let this dry, and when we come back, we are going to do our next layer. Our background wash is dry, and I thought it'd be fun, since I did keep most of the jar pretty light, to use a white uh, crayon, which is basically like a clear piece of wax, to go ahead and add some highlights in uh, some of the areas here. I thought it would just kind of give us another texture, uh, give us that shine, and then we don't have to worry so much about saving our whites because this is going to just protect those areas of the paper where um, where we would want a little highlight. This is um, not really removable, so wherever you put this, it's going to remain, so just kind of keep that in mind, and if you go over a line, it's going to seal that line, or seal any paint that you have underneath. So, um, we're just going to keep that in mind, wherever you put that down, whatever's underneath it is going to remain. So, now I am going to grab, I think I'll grab this 12 round, so I like a big brush, and I'm going to grab some of that nice bright yellow, the Indian yellow, you could use gamboge, any warm yellow will be fine, and I am just going to go in and throw some color here in this tulip, and I hear my uh, kids playing in the backyard, so they could bust the store at any minute if that happens, I do apologize. There you can see where the color is resisting there. And a little bit in here. Now I'm going to grab some of the red. I'm going to let the colors kind of mix on the paper a little bit. I like the look of that. It just gives you a really fresh look. See how the colors just kind of like mix and mingle together? I think that's really nice. But I'm not going too dark because that red is really strong, so I actually have it very watered down. With a nice um, round brush, see how big that is? It comes to a nice point, so I can do everything from details to uh, painting in a large area with that, which is really nice. Go back to that yellow, maybe a little less watery, and I'm going to throw in the stems. Get some of that in the bottom of that flower as well. Now I'm not, I didn't go terribly dark with anything, so I can still go in with more light later. I'm going to grab some sap of green, which again is one that I have in a full pan rather than a half pan because I use so much of it. So that's something to think about when you lay out your palette. How often do I use this color? Is it something I'm just going to use once in a while? If so, then a half pan um, would be good. If it's something you rely on, you use a lot, you're always refilling, then putting in a full pan will save you a lot of um, a lot of time. It'll save you wear and tear on your brushes, and it will be a lot more enjoyable to paint from because it will give you that um, kind of the ability of having a full size studio palette while 
um, in a travel size palette. Like you could have a, even the small little tins of paint and you could do, instead of doing 12 half pans, you could do six full pans. And that way you have the versatility of being able to use a larger brush if you like to, if you like to travel with a larger brush. I have some cut down brushes that I use uh, for travel watercolor painting. They're just, they were long handled brushes. I just chopped the handles shorter so that I could use them for, um, for travel. And you know, just do whatever works, whatever works for you, whatever makes sense for you. Everybody's needs are going to be a little bit different. I love watercolor for travel art because you don't need to have a lot of stuff to be able to have a lot of versatility. All right, so we just left a little gap there where you can see the highlight on the water. And if you want to flick any of these colors on, that's totally up to you. I do like that, but I know not everybody does, so. If you don't like it, don't do it. If you do like it, have at it. I think that's something that's really important to remember is that, you know, if I do something and you don't like it, uh, rather than commenting that, you just ruined the painting, Lindsay, what'd you do that for? You know, I mean, if you're curious about why I chose to do something, absolutely leave a comment, but you don't have to do everything that I do. Everybody is different. So you do what you prefer best. I'm gonna use some of my grays on these rocks. Um, I'm gonna blot my brush off, that's pretty watery. I am going to start back here, I think, with uh, this kind of one in behind there that's pretty dark. I'm actually going to mix some more up because that's really watery. Um, and I need a little more concentrated paint with less water in it. So, do our ultramarine blue and our burnt sienna. I'm blotting off a lot of that extra water. That's the only thing with a big brush. And it could be a disadvantage is that it does hold a lot of water. So, if you're trying to mix colors, you could end up with a lot more. Um, a lot more water in your colors, especially if you're using a student grade paint. So you could use like a synthetic brush to mix and you'd have a much better time of it. Just because you could pick up a lot more paint versus and, and less water. With the hot brush paper though, I do like to work in lighter, more watery layers just because there's not as much mobility in the paint. Now this is gonna wanna bleed into Whoa, this is gonna to wanna to bleed into those um, those other wet colors nearby. So we'll just kinda of keep that in mind. Um, that yellow ochre gray up there. And we're not at the defining anything stage, so you don't fret if you're not happy with how loose it is. But again, the nice thing about the hot press paper is that I can go right up to this. If they do touch, I'm not going to get a big whoosh of color like I often do with a cold press paper. I find that this paper layers really well. That's probably why botanical artists like to use the hot press so much. I mean, they're obviously smoother, so it's easier to capture detail, but the uh, the fact that you can layer it, I think, is um, you can layer and layer and layer, that really helps. And I think it could really help, too, if you're using a student grade paint that wants to lift on you because you would have, um, you'd have a little bit more space where you could layer. I'm gonna go back to that flat brush. If you have a smaller flat, actually I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna take a smaller flat just because it's gonna be a little easier to, to control. Um, I'm gonna take some of my gray here and get my edges. More ultramarine blue in there. And just, you know, approach your paper so you're comfortable. I like to use a flat for this because I find it's just a little bit easier to get a really straight line. No, I do have a trick if I do have something that's uh, that's a little lopsided, like I get my painting done and I realize my vase is crooked, I will mat it, um, I will mat it, I will turn it in the mat a little bit, like in the frame so that you can't tell that it's crooked. So, you know, that's always an option. If you're not sure if you have your ellipse right um, your, for your waterline, and just kind of go in here and there and add a little dab and a little streak and you know don't paint the the solid complete ellipse and that will that will really um, disguise it plus a lot of times it is distorted and you don't see everything so so keep that in mind getting this back of the um, kind of little shadow on the back of the jar more of like a refraction I love what glass does to light 
glass is one of my favorite subjects to paint because it's just uh, it just bends the light and refracts the shadows and adds reflections and the sparkle. It's got all these qualities that are so fun to play with. I like to go upside down again just to get the um, make sure it's symmetrical. I have an easier time looking at it as kind of like an abstract object that's symmetrical versus saying that I'm painting a vase. That helps me. It might help you too. hand against the edge of the pad like this as a guidepost, as a uh, little kind of a painting aid. A very little paint on my brush. I could actually probably use a little bit more on there. A little more concentrated paint. This is a synthetic. Uh, they're all synthetics that I'm using, meaning they're all not made from real fur, but this one is just a golden tackle on. The other one is meant to mimic real fur, so it has those same absorbent properties. So it's like I'm it's just like I'm using a um, a squirrel brush. Oh that's what you know what that's not sticking because I put a highlight there. I put a wax crayon highlight. Hat. Oh, that worked pretty well, didn't it? So I just went out to the outside of that highlight a little bit. And I like that little bit of extra blue in there, but I don't want it really strong, so I'm just going to water it down. I want to have some of this over here. That blue is going to make the, uh, the flowers pop because the flowers have so much orange on them. Just grab a wet brush and soften this edge a little bit. Now I'm looking at a reference photo. I'm going pretty, I'm going quite a bit from the reference photo and then also a little bit from my, just my own personal um, feeling about this scene, which feels very casual. It's not a fussy bouquet. It's kind of like they just kind of plopped a couple of, um, plopped a couple flowers in a jar and I like that. Um, so I'm kind of going by how it feels and also how it looks. So kind of keep that in mind. You might look at that and be like, why did she paint it like that? That's not the, how it looks to me. To me, I would have it like this. You can do it however you want. All right, just seeing if there's anything I want to darken right now. I've got this brush still out. I love the the crayon highlights. This is, a, you can use any white like crayon or any, like even, you know, like the back to school, you get that box of 24 crayons for 25 cents. Um, like Crayolas. Yeah, use your white crayon. That's the same as this. This is just a, a big one called Leviathan that I got from Top Flight Stamps. But uh, I know there's just like plain white, like clear wax sticks you can buy. Jerry's might have the Sushiwi brand. I'm not sure. Uh, but anything, you could take a, you know, a, a, you know, a little pocket knife to a candle and you can get your own, make your own little sliver of wax that way. It all works the same. You don't need to go buy anything special. Hunter and House probably have something you can use. Um, but there are ones to buy if you want. I'm going to use this little round. This is a number two round. This is from that value set from Jerry's Artorama. I really recommend that set. If you can swing it, I think it's a, between 30 and 40 bucks. Sometimes it goes on sale for less, but um, you get these humongous brushes in there too, along with all the other ones that I used. And I mean, these br brushes this size are expensive. They're a lot of fun to use. I use them a lot in larger paintings and I can't recommend that. Uh, that line of brushes enough. I think they have the they have this brush and the little liner on a try it for like a dollar twenty five or something or two bucks. It's like really inexpensive right now if you want to give that a try. Actually, it wouldn't hurt to have extras. I should probably give myself another set of those. All right, so here I'm just kind of going in and throwing in a little bit of a dark line here at the bottom. And I want to have a little reflection coming down, so I'm just trying to copy what I have above. I'm just going to bring that shape below. And I'm just going to drag in some of those colors that I've used. I'm not going to be really specific or fussy. In fact, a lot of this would just be covered by a mat anyway. But if I was going to frame it, I'm not sure if I will or not, but it's fun. It's just fun to explore this stuff and learn about it. The last thing you should be doing when you're doing a piece like this is worrying about messing it up. Don't worry about messing it up. Worry about learning and um, enjoying the process and 
and uh, getting what you feel onto the paper. I mean, you think, oh, it's a, it's a it's a vase. It's not even my photo. How could I feel something about this? But you can. You take it from the the reference photo is a starting point. It's not something that you need to slavishly copy. It is, you know, some you'll see a picture sometimes. Or you'll you'll be like driving, you'll see a sunset, or you'll see like a maybe is a farm, you know, but on the side of the road, or you'll see something that will spark something in you. And it's gonna be different than what somebody else thinks when they drive by it. Same thing with you know, somebody can take a photograph and mean some mean one thing and somebody else sees it and they interpret something completely different in it. Just like when you paint something, you're painting one thing, but somebody else can look at it, somebody else could see this and be like, Oh, that reminds me of my first apartment and it rained so much when I lived in the city and I used to have, I used to um, get fresh flowers and put them on the windowsill and I remember looking at the rainy windowsill and, um, you know, I mean, it will transport you even though it's an experience you never had, that experience, you know, somebody else will see that experience in your art. It's probably, I'm probably just getting a little too much in the weeds there with it, but, um, but I just don't want you to be afraid to paint what you, what you feel, even if you are following a tutorial by somebody else, you can still interject your own, your own uh, feelings and thoughts and experiences in it, because we all have had different experiences and we all have something to offer. Okay, now I'm gonna go in with a little bit stronger of that yellow on its own. I like to do a little, you know, if you can let things mix on the paper, you're gonna get a little bit fresher of a look. I'm gonna go a little bit bigger of a brush. Here's my number eight. I had some open stock Lucas Paintson's palette and I had a pan of their Oxgall because I don't think the Lucas paints have Oxgall in there. And, um, and it would get really, really soggy and actually ran onto the lid of my palette, but I just left it there because I figured, oh, I might need that if I want some paints that flow really well. And, uh, and I just brushed up my brush in it and it got all kind of sticky. <laughs> and you can go and deepen any other colors that you want to deepen. I like to keep a lot of the looser aspects, so I'll be I'll try to be quite careful to make sure that I'm not just I'm not just darkening everything. I want to make, I want there to be a reason why I darken certain things. You can go in and sop up extra color too with your brush. Just wipe it off and go in and sop, off the, sop up the extra. If you want darker shadows on the, the tulip stems, you can take that sap green and a little bit of the blue we've already used, ultramarine, rather than taking a new blue. I Maybe just a little bit here and there. I wouldn't do it everywhere though. I can see a little bit of a shadow up here. And the flower on the inside will need to be brightened up a little bit. I love that we have that wax on there so I don't have to worry about keeping that uh, pristine. And don't paint every little detail because the the water is would be dist distorting stuff in there. A little bit of the yellow. Okay, I love that yellow. I want to flick some of that. In the background there, maybe a little bit in the in the jar itself. I want to have a little bit of color kind of indicating this uh, surface that it's sitting on. I like how the paint kind of puddles and pools and behaves on the hot press. I generally use cold press. And 
and I would like to work a little more blue in there. I'm just taking the ultramarines, that's what we've already used. Try to stick to a limited palette and uh, that will keep your work looking nice and fresh. You're not gonna get you're not gonna get a lot of mud if you don't have a ton of colors going on. It's fun to kind of flick on some color too because then when it hits areas that are already starting to um, that are already wet, it'll it'll move a little bit differently. Let's take a smaller brush and add some details. Add a little bit of a indication of the top of this jar. I want to do a little more detail up here on the flower itself. I've got the number two round and some scarlet. I've got some rough edges that I'm not really crazy about, and I would like to take the flower here and have a, a little bit more detailed so I have a little contrast between that and the rest of the flower that's, and the rest of the picture that's a little bit more loose. So I'm going in and putting in some texture of the veins just with this round brush, kind of curving the lines from the edge of this petal, which is really the middle of the petal, because we're only seeing half of it, and dragging it into the towards the center. I find when you have something like this, you know, if you detail one aspect, um, your brain will put in all the details for the other petals or the other flowers, so all you really need to do is detail one of them. I'm just using the red on its own for right now because I don't want to muddy the color. I might add a little bit of blue into it, but since this is an orangey red, um, I know it will muddy it a little bit and I don't want that to happen. I kind of just want to get rid of raggedy lines. Tulips are a little bit of a stiff flower unless you have like a parrot tulip, like your standard tulips are a little stiff. So I don't want to have, you know, I don't, I want this painting to be pretty loose, but I also want it to, you know, look like a tulip. I don't want it to look completely off the rails. You've got to have enough water in your paint so that it will flow off your brush, but you don't want so much that uh, you can't get a crisp line. Like, that's a little too much, really. Now I'm going to grab some yellow. I'm going to blot my brush because it's way too much water on there. Let's try this. Oh, I like that all right. And that will soften the red a little bit too. And the yellow also just adds a hint of kind of sunshine. Get some of that in the stems. And you can see where we've had the uh, where we've had the resist in there. Now I feel like I do need to darken up the other flower a smidgen because um, I'm just going to move my reference photo on my computer up a little bit just because I have these other colors. I've intensified the colors a little bit up there, so I do want to brighten them up, but I don't really want to add the detail to this flower. I just want to kind of make the values match a little bit more, but I want to keep it a little bit looser. You'll notice the size of brush you speckle with will affect the size of the speckles. So if you have a small brush, you're going to give you smaller speckles because it's only going to hold so much water. 
Uh, now I'm going to go back in with some grays and add some details. Now this has been a very limited palette color. We've done one red, one yellow, a brown, a blue, and then a yellow ochre. So it's five colors. It's not a, not a lot, but it's plenty. Negative painting around that stem. I kind of lost that before. I like to hold my brush at a 90 degree angle. I apologize if that gets in your view. That helps me keep a nice steady line. Again, struggle to keep your paint thick enough so that it's as rich as you want, but thin enough so it rolls off your brush. Now the shed behind this rock is darker than the rock, so I'm making sure that I represent that. Values probably are the most important thing when you're painting, much more important than, um, than colors. So when you're looking at something, try to get your values. I'm keeping it zoomed in a little bit so you can see a little bit better. We'll zoom out in a minute so you can see the whole picture. Open the back door, you can hear the beautiful rain. You might hear a cat in a minute because she's outside, that's why I opened the back door. So she can come in if she wants to. They are getting adjusted to Miss Miss Penny the dog. I think they'll be friends once they all once they get used to one another. The cats are not totally impressed at the moment. A shadow on a rock in back here. I like to put in a shadow and then spread it or spread around the paint. You can take as much time with this as you want, or you could keep it to a little sketch. It's totally up to you. You can paint it larger and go into more detail. This rock needs to be a little bit darker, actually. But as with any painting, see what you can get from it. See what you can learn. It's always a good idea to try something in your art rather than just do the same old thing every time. Reinforcing the water line there. And you really don't see much of the water line in back, it's much lighter, so I'm just going to lighten up that paint on my brush. And just kind of um, suggest it. And try a different kind of paper. If you're like feeling stuck in a rut, maybe if you try a different type of paper, you would feel a little bit more free, or it would kind of give you that. Um, a lot of times, we just kind of we get we kind of plateau a little bit, and we're trying to recapture how we felt the first time we painted something. And by switching to a different um, paper or a different paint, a lot of times that can help rekindle that feeling of of the hobby being new again. So here I've got some more of that gray. It's mostly blue, a little bit of the, um, the burnt sienna. I'm just going to go in and add some of that to the edge of this tulip. I'm not going to go too crazy because I don't want to let it get muddy. In the center. I could do a little bit on this front part of the tulip where it's kind of pressed against the glass. It's a little bit darker. The 
just give it some horizontal lines to indicate a tabletop there. And I think that's all I'm going to do to this painting. I really enjoy painting this. I think this is one of those fun paintings that you could just kind of splash paint around, do it large, uh, play with the design, and um, really have a great time with it. I hope you enjoyed this. Please give me a thumbs up if you did. Um, let me know if videos like this are too long or if the length is just fine. Um, I'm trying to make videos that you will enjoy watching, and um, your feedback is very important to me. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to check out our sponsor, jerrysartorama.com. You can find all the supplies I use there, and they will be linked down below along with the coupon code. Thanks for watching. I thanked you like three times. I'm just so grateful that you've stuck around along this, this long. Uh, Till next time, happy crafting.